So welcome everybody to today's session for Bridges to Better Business. Uh, my name's Angie and I'm the program coordinator for the Business Center Guelph Wellington. Uh, today we're joined with Peter Cameron from the Ontario Cooperative Association. Did I get that right? I'm pretty sure I got that right. Perfect. And so as you're watching, for those of you who are watching through our live streams, please feel free to put any comments or questions uh, in the comment section of the live stream. I will be monitoring that through the whole session. Um, if you have any questions or uh, statements or things that you want to connect with us afterwards, do feel free to reach out to me. I monitor all our social media as well. You can email me at success at wealthbusiness.com and I can connect you directly with Peter. I'll reiterate this at the end of the session as well, just for those who missed it. So welcome, Peter. I'll let you take it over from here. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, it's nice to be here and um, I'm going to go through uh, this PowerPoint. I'm going to give some background on co-ops and then I'm going to get into some specifics um, around some stats about uh, how we're, the co-ops are affecting the Ontario economy. And then I'm going to tell a few stories of how co-ops have uh, helped improve uh, local communities. Uh, but I'd like to start off first by pointing out that it's actually co-op week this week. Um, it's uh, international, uh, pardon me, national. And uh, so there'll be activities all across Canada, but it is International Credit Union Day on Thursday. And that uh, is all over the world. So I always start off my presentations by going to Simon Sinek's Golden Circle. I don't know if you've heard of it before, but it, it, it's pretty straight ahead, I think. If you don't know why you're doing something, the how and the what really don't follow very well. So right off the bat, why do we want a better Ontario? Well, I go back to uh, the definition of insanity. <laughs> if we keep doing the things the same way we've always done them, uh, that's just, you know, unfortunately inappropriate and crazy. <laughs> so uh, why we have a growing economic disparity, we have environmental crisis, we have political paralysis, and of course we have COVID. And that, um, you know, we need to come together to work on those issues. And everybody knows about uh, the growing economic disparity. I mean, it's crazy. We have billionaires, and yet we have people who are lined up for food banks. Why is this? I mean, there's, there's clearly enough money. Uh, you probably heard about uh, the Pandora Papers. It was just released. It's a follow-up to um, the Panama Papers, that all these tax havens are where people who have tons of money are tucking it away and they're not paying their taxes. And therefore a lot of governments don't have the money to provide the programs that uh, are needed by everyone. Climate change, um, you know, uh, in a few weeks, there's going to be the COP26 in uh, Glasgow in Scotland. I mean, again, if you've been following the situation or you just you know, step outside and see what's been happening with the weather, and hearing about the forest fires and, and flooding. I mean, we've got to do something about it. And uh, unfortunately, the, the present economic system has caused this. And so therefore, we need a different way of working if we're going to uh, fix uh, climate change. And part of the political divisiveness, and, and every again, everybody knows about the battle that happened in the States. And uh, now Mr. Biden is president, but uh, the Trump and the Republicans are still causing problems and holding back changes, necessary changes uh, that have to happen there. And of course, we just had an election and it, you know, basically nothing changed. And so we have to work, um, hopefully that all parties will work together to make uh, the necessary uh, supports that have to happen for housing and for, uh, equity and diversity in Canada. And then again, fighting COVID. Um, we, need, we need everyone working together to do the right things that, that will help um, uh, provide health, appropriate health care for, for everyone. So the business environment is changing. It, it needs to change more. 
Uh, there are movements out there that are actually starting to, to help make a difference. The Occupy movement in the past, Me Too, crowdfunding, yes, we can. And, and the consumers are basically fighting back. They're saying, you know, we want corporations to do better. And right now, only 5% think they are. And only 10% of people uh, have a lot of trust and confidence that business is behaving ethically. So we've got to come up with a better way of working. And how is that? We think it's time to enter the cooperative era. It's about people, planet, and profit. you got to make money. The question is who gets it, who benefits from it. And the cooperative model provides an opportunity to still do business in the marketplace, but to better share uh, the power and the resources and the benefits, all the while respecting the planet. So here's something simple, uh, pardon me, a simple definition of uh, the co-op uh, model. It's, it's basically people getting together to work uh, cooperatively, democratically, to solve whatever um, needs or uh, services or products that they need. And they do it with principles. They have these seven international principles. Uh, open and voluntary membership, democratic member control, uh, member economic participation, the people who actually do the work benefit. Uh, they're independent uh, corporations. They are corporations. There are three corporations, uh, private corporations, nonprofit corporations, and cooperative corporations. Uh, we also believe in education and training for the members and information sharing. So it's open and transparent. People understand what's going on. And then we also believe in cooperation amongst co-ops and concern for community is key. It's part of the people, planet and profit. I have a question in the chat quickly, Peter. Yeah. Um, it says, does this mean that co-ops will be standing up more and doing advocacy as well? Well, they are now. I mean, we are advocating uh, in terms of uh, working uh, through our national organization, international organization, and in Ontario uh, for housing. We're trying to get uh, more affordable housing. I could go on. Do you want me to? Uh, yeah. That's great. Thank you. If yeah, they have I'll, more yeah. questions, I'll let you know. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, uh, just a quick history. Um, you know, back in, in 1844 in England, uh, here's an example of a community that was wanting some change. They write, uh, they only had access to the company store and it, uh, they felt the prices were too high, the products weren't that great. And they said to themselves, well, why don't we get together and start our own store? So that's what they did. And it opened just before Christmas uh, in 1844 and uh, it was very successful. And within 10 years, there were hundreds of these type of food co-ops, community food co-ops throughout of uh, England. Um, this gentleman, I always love this statement from um, Dr. King. He was a progressive person back then. He, he said the obvious thing that, you know, everybody has to, to eat. Why don't we, uh, and go to a store, why don't we run our own stores? And that's what they did. So again, the co-op model, it differs from um, uh, existing system in that there are values behind it. It's not just about the bottom line, not just about making money. It's about cooperative values. It's about democratic structure. And it's about um, the, the profits going back to the people who do the work and sharing with the community. And again, this is just a, an easy comparison between the standard private business corporation and a co-op. The co-op exists to serve the members the business corporation exists to serve the shareholders. So here's some examples of um, co-ops that uh, you might have seen some of these names. Uh, you might gaily, you might have some of their milk, you might be in a credit union, you might have had a co-op cab, um, you might have had some St. Albert cheese, you might know people living in a housing co-op. Uh, there's even uh, flower growers have a co-op. Uh, there's all kinds, virtually, from cradle to grave. Uh, if you uh, are in the GTA area, you've driven by the CNE, you saw the turbine. It was one of the original turbines. It was a co op that uh, set that up, Toronto Renewable Energy Co op. I mentioned co op cabs, they're all over the city. Uh, 
this is a great uh, co-op that serves people with uh, disabilities. Uh, their parents are, are members, they're members, and uh, they are doing great. And they're involved and um, having jobs and feeling a sense of ownership. This is a student co-op at York University, student-run cafe. Um, this is a great uh, beer company in Kitchener, Together We're Bitter. Uh, there's another one in uh, London, the London Brewing Co-op. Here's the basic structure. Um, you know, the democratic function is at the top. They, the members, they elect the board. The board um, hires uh, management, sets policy, and like all businesses, you know, you got to have a business plan, you got to have your your marketing, you have to raise finance. The difference is that it's controlled by the members, not uh, by some shareholder off in New York City. Consumer co-ops are like credit unions. Again, the members elect the board and it provides, a, it's like, it's a bank, but it, it's a democratic bank. It's owned by the people and the benefits go back to the members. Farmer co-op, Gailey, I mentioned earlier, they come together and they, uh, instead of just selling their milk to somebody else, they actually process it. They, um, they make uh, whipped cream, ice cream, uh, yogurt, uh, cottage cheese, everything. So like any corporation, they benefit from the vertical integration and it, uh, the benefits go to their, to their members. A worker co-op, a unique part about a worker co-op is that you actually work at that business. And so you have, again, more control, more say. Uh, Urbane Cyclist is, is a great example of a uh, small worker co-op in Toronto. And um, because of COVID and the interest in, in bicycles, they have done very well in terms of repair. But unfortunately, uh, they've run out of stock of, of bikes because everybody's buying a bike and, and it's hard to get them because of the, the supply chain problems. But that's a whole other issue. A worker co-op, you, you work at it and you wear two hats. You're an owner as well as a worker member. And then a multi-stakeholder co-op, as the name implies, there's different stakeholders. And uh, Together We're Bitter, the beer company co-op is a, an example. They have worker members, they have consumer members, and they have um, uh, financial uh, supporters. And so they all uh, work together to make it a um, excellent enterprise. So to start a co-op, you need five people. If it's a consumer or a producer co-op, you only need three to start if it's a worker co-op. Um, you file your articles in corporation with the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services. And if you want to raise capital, you go through the Financial Services Regulatory Authority. And again, co-op legislation. These are all just some, some specific details. And if you ever have any questions or you need any help in forming a co-op, you can get in touch with the Ontario Cooperative Association. We can help you through uh, some of these issues. It's, it's not that hard. Um, and as I mentioned, you go through Service Ontario, which is Ministry of Government and Consumer Services. Co-ops are worldwide. There are over a billion members um, worldwide, 95 countries. In Canada, there's uh, over uh, 9,000 co-ops and they're um, the 8.7 million members. Uh, there's housing, as I said, retail, um, healthcare, all kinds of different ones. But specifically, I wanted to get to Ontario where we have over 1,500 co-ops. And they, um, just even in the housing sector, there's 44,451 Ontario households that are living in co-op housing. It provides 57,000 full-time jobs. Uh, they're in communities, for over 400 communities. Again, a lot of people don't know it, but when you look around, there's a lot of co-ops out there. And then some of the stats, um, there's 3.3 billion in income. These, uh, uh, these are um, slightly dated stats. Uh, we're waiting for the, the latest um, uh, Stats Canada uh, information, but this is close, 3.3 billion in income and a breakdown between say what the credit unions or general co-ops or uh, insurance and investment co-ops bring. Um, 
57,000 jobs broken out again between the, the credit unions and uh, general co-ops. Taxes paid um, that, that obviously go and support other programs. And the economic value um, that the co-ops in, in Ontario bring to the economy is $6 billion. But I wanted to get down to telling you some stories. Um, how does it really impact a community? Well, in Northern Ontario, uh, some people might have heard of a, a small town called Moonbeam. It's between Hearst and Kapuskasing. And there's a picture of the store. Um, it was owned privately. Um, the gentleman wanted to retire. And if he closed the store, then people would have had to drive uh, 20 minutes uh, either to Hearst or Capitol Casing, and in the winter, longer and sometimes serious problems just to get literally milk and bread. So the community came together and they said, um, we'll sell memberships, we'll create a community co-op, and we'll buy it. And they did. And now it's a very successful um, community uh, cooperative grocery. And so it's serving that area and they control it and they uh, are running it very, uh, servicing the needs of that community. Here's another example, small but, but important. Um, there was a uh, fitness uh, group called Curve. Some of you might've heard of it. It was a fitness uh, operation mainly targeted to women and it was closing in Concarta. Well, the women uh, in that area really liked it and said, listen, we, we want to keep this thing going. How can we do that? And they did it through um, selling memberships and creating a, a community co-op. And it's been running since 2015 called Kincardin Ladies Fitness Co-op. And because that model was so successful, the people in Fergus, women in Fergus, where another curves was closing, they followed the model and they set up the Fergus uh, uh, fitness co-op. One more. Um, in Campbellford, Ontario, which is sort of near uh, Peterborough, they um, had a small theater. And again, independently owned. Uh, the owner wanted to retire. And they said to themselves, uh, you know, I mean, well, it, it, this was an important sort of community hub that if it closed, it could have been a boarded up fire truck in the city. And they said, no, we want to keep it going. And so they sold, pardon me, they sold memberships and they bought it from him and they upgraded. They uh, moved from film to digital. And uh, actually I'll do, do a little, uh, some specific slides here. It was 2010, they, they created the business plan, they incorporated it, they did the membership drive, and then they fixed up the marquee. They, as I said, switched over from uh, film to digital. And so that, you know, they could have you know, any film, um, still calling them films. Uh, they, uh, when Ontario Place closed, they uh, got the, the seats donated to them. And so they had volunteers come and they uh, changed all the old seating and put in uh, this quite nice stuff. And then they also upgraded to make it accessible. They uh, fixed up um, the insulation in the place, got a new boiler. They even put on a green roof. Again, people took pride in it. The community really got behind it. And it's a successful, um, as I said, community hub. Now, of course, uh, COVID hit after um, in 2019, end of 2019, just as they'd finished putting in new seats and painting and everything. But um, with, with some support, they also, from the Community Foundation, they upgraded the ventilation and um, they've now opened up again. And it is uh, serving um, the community and running first run films and speakers events and uh, music events. It is a real success story how a co-op can serve a small community. And this is uh, they all they got together, they had their 10th anniversary.
Here's some more resources. Um, you can see some of those uh, later, but again, you can just go to our site, uh, um, ontario.coop. We, uh, we have our own upper level domain. And, and now um, I can answer any questions. Uh, so we have a couple yeah. questions in the chat. Um, uh, one is, it seems that a lot of people choose housing co-ops for reasonable rent, but participation is a tough sell. Any suggestions? Well, um, I think it's interesting. There are two kinds of, of uh, co-ops, housing co-ops. There's the uh, nonprofit housing co-ops and there's equity housing co-ops. So in the nonprofit housing co-ops, you do pay a housing charge, but you do elect the board and you do um, uh, have a say in how it will run and uh, other improvements or changes you'd like to make to it. Um, I think the long-term benefit is that there's no landlord taking off the profit and or raising the rent when it isn't necessary. Obviously, there has to be uh, changes that, uh, you know, if you need a new roof or you need improvements, those are costs that everybody would incur. But it's not what's happening right now in Ontario, where uh, I don't know if you've heard this, the um, uh, when, when landlords are actually moving people out and um, jacking up the rent by fixing it up and then putting it back on the market. And so people are losing out. So, so in the housing co-op, that couldn't happen because you control it. Equity housing co-ops is slightly different in that, that you, uh, you actually own the building in the, and have a share in it. And when you purchase it and or if once you're there and you decide to leave and sell it, you, you um, can benefit from the equity you've built up in it. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that for now. What's, what's the that's, other question? Those are great. Um, uh... A statement that finance is needed to help co-op scale. Um, somebody mentioned Karma Co-op in Toronto, I guess is a great co-op and they charge a fee if you don't participate. Um, I have a question asking, are there any courses that groups can take to learn how to start co-ops like college, university, et cetera? There are some courses, um, but again, I think if you want to get in touch with us, we've got all kinds of um, material and support. Uh, you can also go, um, I encourage people to go to their small business enterprise center or get help from the community futures or futurepreneur. You've probably heard about futurepreneur. They uh, provide support for entrepreneurs to get going and they uh, now support co-ops. Um, yeah, no, there, there's lots of resources out there. There are technically some courses. Uh, I know the University of Saskatchewan, the, the University of Winnipeg, uh, St. Mary's University in Halifax, there are you know, academic courses, but we can help you. The various uh, Ontario Cooperative Association and other provincial associations can assist you. Uh, Cooperatives First, uh, if you check that out, they're based in Saskatoon. They have all kinds of great information on their site also. Canadian Worker Co-op Federation. They've got great information on their site. So yeah, no, no, um, no shortage of material. That's wonderful. Um, there, another question I have is there seems to be few worker co-ops in the restaurant cafe industry. Are there unique challenges facing those businesses using the co-op model? I don't think it's unique to the co-op model. I think that those are, um, you know, businesses that have uh, low margins and are, um, and the wages are low and the competition is quite high. Uh, there's um, uh, several, uh, there's a, a co-op called Planet Bean in Guelph that uh, has been going for several years. Uh, Just Us in Nova Scotia. Um, Great chocolate uh, a worker co-op called the Co Coco Camino. La Siembra is the name of the co-op. Um, I mentioned Urbane Cyclist. Um, I think, you know, again, some of the margins are, 
the margins are the main problem. And when you're up against, say, Tim Hortons or you're up against Starbucks or, or some of these very uh, established, um, yeah, the, the, the cafes, they, 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 it's pretty hard. But I think a lot of people now are supporting local and want uniqueness. And so there are still opportunities on that level. And with a worker co-op, you are in control. And so um, I think uh, the sense of loyalty and the sense of um, you know, self-determination are big factors. Um, I have a statement. Um, would love to see more examples of co-ops discussing their business in the community. Uh, was a quick statement. And then uh, I have another question. Do you see examples of service-based entrepreneurs such as group of wellness providers coming together to form cooperatives? Uh, very interesting. Uh, great opportunity right now, especially uh, unfortunately because of COVID and what has happened with the private uh, long-term uh, long care homes. Uh, they um, uh, they're not providing the same service and care and that a, a worker controlled one, I think would be better. And there is a, an example that just started in Peterborough called Home Care Worker Co-op. And um, there's a uh, one in a PSW, a personal support worker, uh, worker co-op um, out of um, Renfrew, I think, near Ottawa. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that, you know, that is uh, a field in, in the healthcare and the seniors and, and home care. There's real opportunities for uh, workers and nurses, PSWs, uh, to run their own business rather than work for the large corporations who, you know, charge them out at uh, $27.50 an hour, but only pay them $15. Um, another question, what are some of the bigger challenges co-ops face in their operation? Well, again, I think business is business. Um, they face the same uh, challenges uh, of any business. The difference is um, that the profits, instead of going off to somebody else, some shareholder, they do go back to the member owners. And so I, I think if you had, you know, compared apples to apples and you had one business that was, um, you know, run by the workers who knew or the, the, the consumers who supported it versus Walmart or, you know, some group that does everything with cheap labor. Um, I, I think that the, the sense of commitment and loyalty and, um, you know the values, the principles that that this this business would would outperform a um, private corporation that was just interested in the in the money. I think the triple bottom line is better than the single bottom line. Yeah, totally. Um, I've got a couple of thanks in the comments. I don't see any more questions. So what I'll do is. Uh, let me mention one other thing, Phil, that yeah. you'll hear more about and people might platform co-ops. Um, right now, everybody's heard of Uber, Airbnb, um, TaskRabbit, all these businesses that are, you know, the, the, the owners are the owners of the apps, not the people who actually do the work or the drivers. So we're trying to create more, and there are, uh, more platform driver co-ops, uh, like co-op cabs, where the money actually goes to the people who do the, uh, do the work. And so um, we're working with a group of artists in Toronto trying to create a, um, an artist co-op that the, the benefits of their work will come back to them. Um, there is a, a great platform co-op uh, called Stocksy out of um, BC, where it's um, uh, photos, stock photos that you would see in magazines or or anywhere that that people sell their photography, and um, uh, it has over a thousand members, 
and it is run democratically by those members and the profits go back to them. Stocksyunited.coop. Um, so that model is very flexible and there's even a group now started called Fairbnb instead of Airbnb that is, is controlled by the people who actually um, rent their places, but also it has more roots in the community so that you don't have situations where whole condos, blocks of condos are, are basically owned by, you know, uh, absentee landlords through Airbnb and causing problems for the people who actually live there. Fair b, &B. check it out. That's really cool. I didn't know about either. Um, I'll check out both of them myself too. Um, somebody commented, uh, staff professionalism is an issue they're having with their co-op. Any suggestions? Um, well, again, um, you know, um, sometimes we hear, hear complaints uh, about um, maybe a housing co-op staff situation or board situation. But I mean, democracy is not perfect, but it's better than the alternative. And so you, if you have an issue, you need to go through the appropriate channels with your board um, to, to make sure that the services that you expect for the membership are provided. And if you don't like it, then change the board, change the, use the democratic um, option to um, um, provide the proper service or product that you want. Um, yeah, I, and you know, I mean, it, again, it's not perfect, but at least it gives you that opportunity where a lot of people, you know, they go to work nine to five, they punch in, punch out, and they have no control whatsoever. Well, through a democratic co-op, you do have some, so you have to exercise that opportunity. Nice. Um, uh, somebody made a comment about maybe some co-op associations can connect with unions to see if there's an interest in starting worker co-ops in that format. Um, We're doing that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, that's a good one, yeah. We actually, um, a value co-op out of Vancouver started, uh, V-A-L-U, value co-op, started through uh, support from unions. And historically, I mean, think about it. Unions started because there was a problem perceived and real, um, with management and the owners. So they got together collectively to assert their rights. Well, what co-ops have, uh, and members who started them had, had uh, did, <laughs> they uh, came together and said, well, we'll start our own store like they did in 1844. Rather than you know having a union to fight the owners, they said, we'll start our own. And that's what they did. Um, another question I have is what are some of the common reasons that co-ops might fail? I think lack of communication. Um, people might be familiar with the Mountain Equipment Co-op. Mountain Equipment Co-op, super successful. Over 45 years ago, it started with just a handful of people, I think six, and it grew to, a, oh, I forget how many million members, technically, I think it got up to about 5 million members. But as it grew and expanded um, and stores, you know, were started all over the country, unfortunately, the board was elected by a very small group and it sort of took on this corporate mentality and lost touch with the membership. And they uh, also got hit by COVID, like so many others, they were overextended. And they ended up selling to a hedge fund out of California. And, but they didn't even go back to the members to ask them, hey, could we work together to bail out and, and, um, and save Mountain Equipment Co. So communication, communication, governance, uh, making sure that the members uh, access to information open and transparent, those, those are the key things that can hurt a co-op. Um, yeah. That's, that's I could. And got a comment that Mech was a disaster. Um, so I also have a comment of I think there needs to be a conference, and I'm assuming that's related to discussion of the various types of co ops. 
I could have a whole co-op conference, I'm sure. Yeah, um, we, you know, we did do them every year, but unfortunately, you know, they, they have become uh, uh, Zoom conferences like this, right? If you want to see a very inspiring um, example of worker co-op in Spain, check out Mondragon, Mondragon. It is um, the most successful worker co-op in the world. Started with five people in the 50s, and now it's 80 or 90,000 member owners have their own retail stores, their own university, their own heavy manufacturing, light manufacturing, their own bank. Very successful. Mondragon. Yeah, I have put, I'll put that in the chat so people can see it. Because um, that's cool. Um, I'll also put in the chat some of the other ones that I we discussed, including Stocksy. I found the links and stuff for those so that if anybody wants to review them afterwards. Um, and I'll put in the chat any uh, resources uh, Peter has sent. Um, if anybody needs any resources or questions, do connect with us. Um, I don't see any more comments. Um, so what I'll do is we'll say goodbye to our Facebook friends um, who've been joining us. Um, as usual, thank you so much, Peter, for joining us. This is always informative and I love learning new different types of businesses, different structures and really getting the information out there um, that there's not just one way to start a business uh, at all. There's lots of ways. Um, so connect with us if you have any questions. If you have any questions, comments or more things that you would like to ask Peter, do send them to me, success at wealthbusiness.com. Or you can connect with Peter directly at the Ontario Cooperative Association. So thank you. We'll see you all again soon. Thank you, Angie.